Welcome everyone. We are very excited to have you all here today and this is Ekaterina Stoops, e-learning faculty development coordinator. The, fa the topic for our um, workshop today is involved or engaged creating a great student experience. And in this workshop, the presenter, Joel Domingo, will share his strategies for engaging students in the classroom. Uh, during this workshop, you will have several, we will have several interactive activities and to participate in these activities, you can use the chat and type your questions and comments in the chat or you can use your microphones and speak. But then when, when you're not speaking, please keep your mics muted so that we're not getting any background noise. Um, if you have any technical issues during the workshop, just use the chat to let us know about the issue you're experiencing, or if you lose connectivity you, uh, in Collaborate, you can always email us at BB Support. And now I would like to introduce our presenter, Joel Domingo. Joel is Associate Professor and Associate Program Director of Higher Education and Nonprofit Leadership at City University of Seattle. Joel has a history of leadership and teaching in several education, community, and civic organizations. Uh, his work focuses on leadership studies, community and, work and school collaboration, disability issues, and socially transformative practices. And without further ado, uh, Joel, please take it away. All right, thank you, E. Katrina. It's great to be here. I'm going to share my video to show you that here I am. Hi, everybody. Um, good to see you. I'm here in Seattle on a nice sunny, or soon to be sunny, Monday afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn off the uh, video right now since now that you know what I look like, I'll be here talking. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about what we're talking about today now. I am going to present on creating a great student experience. And there's my contact information there. Uh, feel free to contact me at any time. Um, I'm available also by Skype if you want to have a conversation, uh, live or uh, virtually. I'm always amenable to that. and I love talking to other faculty. Uh, I want to present this information as a colleague. And so I know we're all colleagues in this work. And it's our goal, all of us, to uh, ensure that our students have a great experience. And so what we'll be doing is we'll be talking a little bit about student development theory and just setting the foundation for really the, the practical side of stuff, which is how to engage this in your classroom. Uh, whether it's an online classroom or face-to-face -face classroom, I think the principles behind what we're talking about are going to be very helpful for you as an instructor. So. One of the things that I came across is this picture. And uh, this is a great <laughs> picture of students in class. And you see they're at varying levels of engagement. Uh, you see one student uh, in the back who's engaged. Uh, actually, you know, maybe two or three students are engaged in the, the classroom. Maybe it's a conversation going on. And, and the fourth student uh, there at the front of the picture is deeply engaged in other ways, uh, engaged in REM sleep. So. Uh, you know, there's different ways of being engaged. This is probably uh, one, the student in front, that isn't the most um, supportive or the, the most reinforcing to an instructor, but maybe she's contemplating the material. I'm not sure. But I just thought this was a great picture to start out uh, this webinar to give us context. And the first thing I want to do is this is an interactive webinar. And so this means uh, you're not just going to listen to me, but I want to get your responses to you as colleagues. So what you have here on this slide is what I call a real-time response. And I have this question, what makes for a good in-class student experience? Again, whether that class is physically face-to-face -face or online, what makes for a good student experience? What I want you to do, uh, all participants here and, and even moderators can join, um, you're going to see a bar at the top of the screen where you're going to click the T uh, button, text. That's going to change your um, highlight to the T to a, a, a color. And just go ahead and type anywhere on the slide, real time. So again, what makes, what in your opinion, what makes for a good in-class student experience? I'll open it up to your responses. We're getting some responses right now. Feel free to add more than one, just from your experience. 
So we have humor, we have uh, relevant, fun. Students like to know what they are learning is beneficial to them. Relevant, absolutely. Time feedback, I'm going to guess that's timely feedback. Uh, yes, absolutely. Students love when they have feedback that's done in a timely manner that they don't have to wait, you know, two weeks for their uh, discussion post or feedback is given maybe a couple weeks later. Good use of class time, that's a great one. Uh, Hands-on exercises, absolutely. Timely grading, yep. Oh, some other ones, oh, safety, that's a great one. Safety is an interesting thing because that is a, a emerging concern for a good student experience. Great announcements, absolutely. So again, these are all um, great responses. I see one more, accommodation of their schedule, absolutely. So if you say it's going to be um, you know, an hour, then you limit it to an hour or less. People are busy. Uh, here at our institution, we do our best to honor people's time. Engaging, relevant, absolutely. Thank you so much. This is great. Clear instructions. Yes, absolutely. I'm sure you can think of three or four other ways and three or four new ways that you're engaging in class. And again, this is a conversation that we're having about that. So let's go on to the next slide. Student development theory and shaping the student experience. So how did we get to the point of even talking about what a student experience is? Um, student affairs, I, I'm going to take you back and give you a little history lesson about the whole idea of student affairs and uh, student development theory. This isn't really like any other science or discipline that emerged like your natural science or the physical sciences. Uh, student affairs and the whole idea of student development came uh, around the 1930s and 40s. And it, comes primarily from the field of psychology. Uh, so social scientists were asking, what are the types of experiences that students experience or students have when they go to a higher education institution? Now at the time, in the 30s and 40s, there were traditional students, uh, maybe 18, 19 year olds, going off to a higher education institution. And there was this concept of in loco parentis, which is a Latin term that means, you know, in place of the parent. So as uh, social scientists started researching Hmm, there is something that is happening to students when they are in uh, a whole different setting. And so um, what happened was they were looking at student self-identity. They were looking at the experiences of students. Um, social scientists looked at students' worldview. What's the type of worldview they bring? Uh, how were they shaped growing up? What's the institutional climate like? Meaning, is it a supportive climate? Uh, of course, the big thing, what are academics like at this institution? Um, student affairs professionals started appearing during this time. Uh, so social scientists were also asking about how is the student self-identity created. And so out of all this big conversation, four big questions emerged. Uh, what changes occur while the student is in college or in, you know, in the institution? What factors led to this development? Uh, what aspects of the environment can foster or prohibit growth? growth of them professionally, growth of them personally, growth of them uh, intellectually, and what developmental outcomes should there be from this time in college or in a higher education setting that we can apply. What ended up happening is that many theorists uh, started coming up with these ideas of here's what's happening. And this slide uh, which is adapted from Patton, Wren, and Guido. Uh, this is actually from a book called Student Development in College, which I recommend um, to everybody. It's a, a book that we use here in our doctoral program. This slide overviews seven domains, if you will, uh, seven families of theories. Uh, the first domain are the psychosocial type theories, and there's some big names, seminal authors associated with this, uh, primarily Arthur Chickering and Eric Erickson. Uh, you may recognize the name Eric Erickson from developmental psychology, Erickson's stages of development. Uh, some other families, uh, other domains, are the cognitive structural theories. Uh, Kolb and Perry are two big authors in that um, domain of theory. 
uh, social identity theories that are gender-based theories or social constructs, theories around disability or ability, theories about social class, uh, faith, those are social identity theories. Uh, moral development theories, you know, how do students develop their moral capacity? Kohlberg is a big name. And then you have self-authorship theories, Keegan and Baxter. So I won't go over each individual theories because there's a lot of them, but I wanted to give you the sense that there are different uh, broad categories, and, and we'll cover a couple of the major ones here. The first being the psychosocial theories. Now, psychosocial theories focus on human development, and obviously Eric Erickson being a development psychologist, uh, you can see the connection there. They're more descriptive meaning that they describe the general framework of what's happening in an individual as opposed to saying this student develops at this rate at this time for this period. Okay, Arthur Chickering um, was a uh, 1950s, uh, he lived in the 50s and came up with what he called these seven vectors. Uh, you could think of the seven vectors as more of seven areas. Uh, I like to use the analogy of you're watching a sports event and there's seven different camera angles, but they're all looking at the same event. So each camera angle has its nuance, but it's all describing the same thing. So uh, a couple of them, developing competence is one vector, as he calls. It's about the intellectual and interpersonal con uh, competence. Um, how does the person manage their emotions? How does the person move um, through autonomy, gaining their own self-identity to become an independent uh, person in this world? Um, how do they develop mature interpersonal relationships? Um, how do they develop a sense of purpose? And what about their sense of integrity? So Chickering looked at seven vectors, seven areas or domains. Another family of theory is the cognitive structural theory. And Perry uh, is a big name in this family of theories. Um, the cognitive structural theories say that the stages of development happen one at a time, but they occur in the same order every time. Okay, so students are going to go through this idea and sense of dualism, and then multiplicity, and then relativism. Okay. What dualism means is, let me explain it, it's seeing the world in a dichotomous way. It's either good and bad, right and wrong, black and white, etc. From there, a student develops into multiplicity, and there's different sub areas of this, but the idea of multiplicity is that it's not just black or white, but there's different shades. Um, the facts may not also Facts may not always tell the truth, and authority isn't correct. And then this idea of relativism. This relativism is looking at and being able to look at different viewpoints or seeing uh, what most makes the most sense for people. So again, going from the black and white, this is right, to, hey, there's different ways of seeing the world, um, and you have to make what, you know, make the sense for what makes meaning for you. That's the cognitive structural theories. Other theories, uh, again, I'm going over this uh, quickly because I want to get to the, the application of this, is social identity, theories that are based on socially accepted constructs. So gender theories, feminist theories, uh, ability versus disability. Uh, there's a concept called ableism in disability studies. Um, how do students uh, see themselves as being able or not able to do things and what constructs does the social um, environment play in that? Moral development theories are concerned with moral reasoning and how does one justify their behavior? And then finally, self-authorship theories focus on one stage, on one self-evolution, um, and the whole focus is developing meaning for oneself. All right? So this is all fine and great, and the reality is that these theories all intersect. Uh, Brown, who's a student development theorist, came up with this uh, map, and he describes it as a transit system. And if you've been to any major metropolitan area and they have a transit system, uh, this is a conceptual map. You'll see that there are different uh, theories. For example, the cognitive theory line is the green, the green line. Uh, it intersects with many other types of theories, like the psychosocial line, or I'm sorry, the uh, the Sanford line, which is another family of theories. Um, 
the psychosocial line, which is the blue theories, intersect in different ways with social identity, um, and these are the theorists that intersect with them. So a fun little map showing you that all of these are interconnected. The whole point to all this is that student development theory helps us be better educators and is a critical factor in creating a good learning environment. Okay, so understanding and knowing where students come from, knowing where they are in their stages of development, whether they are 18-year-old freshmen or 46-year-old uh, dissertation students, understanding backgrounds, some of the psychosocial events that help shape uh, people, those are important for us as instructors as we facilitate our instruction in the classes. All right, I want to get to our scenario. This is a, a different interactive exercise where I'm going to give you a scenario and I want you to give your best shot at thinking about the answer here. So let me read this. Student X uh, is the first in her family to go to college. She is also a first generation immigrant um, to the United States uh, as a refugee from a country that had experienced politi political and social turmoil. She worked very hard in high school, had two jobs, and took care of her two younger brothers while her mom and dad worked. She graduated at the top of her class, and this was the first time that she was away from her family and was very homesick. All right, the student is in your class. You gave a test, and it did not go well for her. Consequently, she dropped by your office, visibly upset. You tried to explain the grades, but that made her start yelling. I've always gotten an A, and you were just mean. Don't you understand how hard I worked to get here? Student development theory can give you insight on how to respond. Which theory would help you? All right, so before you is a poll, and you have three responses. Is this psychosocial? Would you use psychosocial? Would you use moral development? Or would you use social identity to help inform how to respond? I'm going to open this up for polling, and it looks like some people have responded. I'm going to show the responses right. Well, let me... Uh, here's the responses kind of evenly split between psychosocial and social identity. Absolutely. Uh, the whole key to this exercise is that it's a trick question. It's a trick question. There is no correct response because every theory here can inform them, some better than others. Uh, not necessarily moral development, though I could argue that there is some moral development in terms of her outbursts. Um, but I think psychosocial is one because, uh, at least from my perspective, psychosocial helps identify some of those um, structures of autonomy. She, you know, if you read the scenario, this was the first time she was away from her family and was homesick. Uh, social identity is one also. I think um, perhaps the social identity uh, respondents uh, linked on to the fact that uh, this is a completely different identity for her and she's coming from a country that's completely different in a different cultural context. And one social identity uh, has changed because she's in a new environment. Both answers are correct. So again, thank you for responding. I think the whole idea is think about the background and think about before you, know, you respond if this were a situation, um, what to do. Uh, I have had this situation, though, <clears throat> not necessarily someone yelling at me, but, you know, I've given a, a test or an exam or a paper, and the student expected to get a great grade because they've been doing well in other classes, and all of a sudden, hey, how do you give me this grade? Uh, I've had to think about, you know, their background, their identity, social identity, all that stuff. I think student development theory is helpful. All right. Thanks for that, everyone. What I want to talk about are some practices that I've found uh, help students engage in the class. And so for that, I want to talk about this idea of creating the conditions for learning. Uh, I want to share with you a, um, a project. It's called the DEEP Project. Uh, Q, um, 
Gregory Q, I believe is his name, or George Q, uh, did a study, an, an ongoing study called the DEEP Project, and it's called Documenting Effective Educational Practices. And so this DEEP Project looked at 20 diverse colleges and universities all across the country, and um, they asked students what makes for a good effective university, and what makes for an environment that they can learn, what promotes effective learning, if you will. So the DEEP project found six key factors that uh, really help the learning environment. Uh, and this is thinking institutionally now. So before we get to the classroom, you know, examples, what does the institution have to do to create this great space for students? Uh, the first is that the institution has a living mission, living mission and a lived educational philosophy. Uh, a second is that the institution has an unshakable focus on student learning. Student learning is paramount. Um, the third is environments are adapted for the educational environment, which speaks to, I think, here at CityU, I can talk about modalities, whether that's a face-to-face -face modality in class or online, the environments of learning are adapted to bring out the best in, you know, whatever that, uh, that modality is. Clear pathways to student success. To student success. That's a huge one that students mentioned that, hey, I see and know where I'm going from this class. Uh, an improvement-oriented ethos that the institution is constantly looking at improving, assessing, uh, and finally a shared responsibility for educational quality and student success. Uh, what this alludes to is the idea that um, faculty, work with administration, student services, that it's all in concert, work together for the students. So this means that everybody is responsible for student success uh, at every level, at whatever interaction point. So some of the examples I'm going to give you are some things that I've used, and again, this is creating a conversation, but the first um, is called creating a pathway. So in the doctoral program here at City University, uh, we um, have an introductory class, LDRD 600. Um, after that, students go into their first academic class. Um, during that period, students are given what's known as a long-term schedule, which is in essence a pathway that shows the classes they would take and when. Uh, this gives them clarity and a roadmap towards graduation. So when students go through the program in the first uh, couple of quarters, uh, we work with the student success advisors to create what's known as a long-term plan or a long-term schedule. We lay out what classes the student is going to take at what quarter and at what time. So, and then we adjust it based on their course load. Sometimes in the course of their program, they say, I want to increase the pace and instead of taking one class per quarter, I want to take two. That's great, or do it the other way around. So creating a pathway, uh, giving them a clear pathway to student success is paramount. Here's another example of a practice that I've instituted, and I call it happy hour with a professor. And uh, no, drinks are optional, but <laughs> happy hour with a professor. Uh, this is for an online class uh, that I've taught. Is before each major assignment, I offer a live Blackboard collaborate session with students to go over any tips, any last minute advice, and questions that they have before they submit their assignment. So I offer it uh, two to three times every uh, class um, right before the big assignment and it's not a huge time it's maybe a half hour open window saying that hey I'm going to be here you can drop in at any time the focus of our drop-in is that you can ask questions about the assignment you can talk about the entire class you can talk about your program if you want but it's happy our professor meaning that I'm accessible and I'm showing that I care about them I want to make myself available at this certain window of course, they can always contact me during class, but I have this dedicated time that they know, and it's scheduled ahead of time. So that's happy hour with the professor. Another example, um, third example I'll give you, is what's called a class hashtag. Oh, so a class, <laughs> class hashtag is created on Twitter. Um, this is for an online class. So what I do is students throughout the quarter can tweet something that relates to the class subject matter. Uh, we uh, uh, agree on a class hashtag 
So in this case, and back to my example of LDRD 600, um, I asked them, create a hashtag in Twitter, uh, LDRD 600, and then anytime they see something outside of class, they can tweet that. And that we can take a look throughout the quarter and say, hmm, someone tweeted this about leadership, uh, which is the subject matter here. Uh, it makes for a great conversation. In fact, I have used the class hashtag idea, not just for throughout the quarter, but then I've also had a Twitter, live Twitter chat with students. So the open office hours, I've said, let's do the open office hours, the professor happy hour, and do a Twitter chat. So the Twitter chat, if you haven't done it, it's a great um, uh, technique to use for an online class. Um, it gets students to use social media and it gets them engaged in a completely different new way that's fun and and short. Okay? So those are the examples that I want to give you. Some three that I've used and I have others. But what are ways that you can foster relevance? So think about this. What are ways that you can foster a way that they can apply what they are learning? immediately. How can you empower them to have ownership? So the Twitter chat empowers them to have ownership on this because they're facilitating some things too. Clarity. Do they know what the objectives are? In each class um, here at CityU, at least in all our classes uh, in our school, we in every class have the class objectives and outcomes listed clearly and succinctly uh, on the class so students know, they know in each module, what they're going to do, what their objectives are. And finally, the thing is, it's fun. Uh, we do our best to make things fun for them, make sure they're engaged, that they feel that it's relevant to their learning, everything that you guys talked about in that poll. All right, I want to end with this uh, neat little list. It's called the Beloit Mindset List. And Beloit College is a small liberal arts college, I believe, in Ohio in the United States. And the list is. Uh, really the creation of a couple of professors who noticed way back when, oh gosh, about 20 years ago, that they are out of touch with their students. Now Beloit College is a traditional liberal arts institution and uh, they were dealing, these professors were dealing with the 17, 18 year old high school students that were going to be incoming freshmen. And so you can translate this a bit to different audiences, but I thought this was a fun little exercise and list to uh, explore. Because it asks, what are the social and cultural forces that have shaped students? Uh, go back to Chickering's seven vectors here. Traditional, uh, but again, it's a traditional list. It's talking about traditional students, but it forces us to consider the forces, the social, the political, the economic forces that shape everybody. And so here's the list. For many that are entering college now, or the class of 2020, this is just a partial reading of the list. These entering freshmen, traditional age freshmen, uh, for them, West Nile has always been a virus found in the United States uh, that they have never had to watch or listen to programs at a scheduled time. Think about that. Uh, if you want to reach them, you better send a text, and emails are often ignored. Uh, they disagree with their parents as to which was the first Star Wars episode. Um, <laughs> yes, that's true. Uh, NFL coaches could throw a red flag and question the ref. Never heard of before, <laughs> but now this is the audience that we're dealing with. Uh, books have always been read to you on Audible. They have always eaten irradiated, irradiated food. Uh, airline tickets have always been purchased online. There have always been IMAX on desks. Uh, instant trayless ice cubes have never been a novelty, and Michael J. Fox has always spoken publicly about having Parkinson's disease. So the point is that you know these are fun lists to look at, and it's talking about a particular audience. But I think the the bigger context is you're looking at the social forces and those other um, cultural forces that are shaping students that come into our classrooms, and being and knowing cogniz being cognizant of them and knowing them can help you as an instructor. In summary, student development theory can inform instructional practice. Um, the goal is to foster clarity and create engaging experiences that are fun and applicable. Uh, and consider where your students are and relate. The whole key, if any one word can describe this whole presentation and webinar, it's about relationships with your students. Knowing who they are and uh, customizing and tailoring instruction to them so that they do have a great student experience. 
So right now I'm going to go ahead and open it up for questions and or comments. Uh, feel free to either include them in the chat window uh, through the chat bubble button on the bottom right of your screen, or if you want, go ahead and turn your mic on, and I will see who's uh, speaking, state your question, and then I'll do my best to answer it. Um, Joel, I have a question about um, that Twitter technique that you described um, earlier. So do you, have you ever had uh, students saying that, um, gosh, um, this is difficult and I don't know how to use Twitter and why we're doing this, you know, kind of questioning um, the whole um, activity because of the technology aspect and uh, how would you deal with this? That is a great question. Thank you. And again, the question was about uh, there might be some ambivalence to using some of these emerging technologies, using a Twitter uh, chat, uh, a Twitter hashtag. Absolutely there are. And so in my class, I make it optional. Um, I always say that this is an optional experience for you if you want to try it. Um, it's not, I'm not going to hold it against you. Uh, I find that in larger classes of at least 10, it works great. Uh, so you, you might have two or three that try it out, and maybe for the first time. And so if they don't try it the first time, I try it again. So you know, this is a trial and error thing. It's not either you do this or you don't get a grade or you get a bad grade. Uh, my whole role is to encourage them into engaging with new forms of technology and uh, maybe I'll see them again in a future class and at that second time I try it again and make it optional and that time they do whereas the first time they don't. So uh, there's no right answer but it's always encouraging and trying to engage them in new and fun ways. Great question. Thank you Joel. Yeah I really like this technique with the, uh, with the Twitter so yeah really liked it. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, are there other questions, either by real-time voice or through the chat bubble? Looks like we had a comment. Great info. Thank you. Exciting examples. Thank you. Absolutely. And again, I leave my contact information here for you to contact me. I love talking about this stuff. Um, I learn from uh, my colleagues, and so uh, I have to admit the Twitter uh, Hashtag idea was not mine, but the Twitter chat um, I tried. I, it was a twist on a, a variation, and so I tried it, and it turned out great. Um, for some classes, it doesn't because the class is only maybe six people, you know, six to ten people. But in the class where I did it, where it was twenty, hey, we got maybe five, five or six showing up, and they loved it, especially before a big assignment. <laughs> All right, are there other questions and or comments at this time? I will wait five more seconds. All right, considering that there are no more questions and or comments at this time, I wanted to thank you and leave you with this one slide. Uh, tell me and I forget, teach me and I may remember, involve me and learn. Uh, attributed to Benjamin Franklin, though I'm sure others have said this as well. Uh, we're all in this together, guys, as faculty, and I think just creating an environment where we can learn from each other and students learn from us, we see that we care about them as people. Uh, we do our best as instructors to get to know their background and, and you know, what shapes them beyond just what they know and what they can demonstrate in terms of their knowledge in class. That's the goal, and I think that makes for a fun learning experience. It's helped with me, and I know uh, it'll help with your students as well. Thanks, and um, from here, have a great day.